Welcome, everyone. Well, we have a great guest today, Dr. Roger Solomon. You can find more information about him at Roger M. Solomon, S O L O M O N dot com or EMDR dot com. He's a psychologist and a psychotherapist specializing in the areas of trauma and grief. He's on the senior faculty of the EMDR Institute, which we're going to be talking about today. And he also provides basic and advanced EMDR training. They have a slew of it at the EMDR.com. Great stuff there. He's trained internationally. He currently consults with the U.S. Senate, NASA, and several law enforcement agencies. He's provided clinical services to the FBI, Secret Service, U.S. State Department, and a host of others. We just don't have all the time in the day to cover everything. He's got a lot of experience, so he's going to tell us a lot about EMDR and how that works with trauma. Before we get started, if you want to support our podcast, make sure to share and subscribe. And hit that like button. We really appreciate that. Let's not waste any more time. Welcome to the show, Dr. Solomon. Welcome, sir. Hello. Thank you for uh, having me on your show. Thank you very much for being here. This is a, it's an interesting topic because we, we, I've covered a lot of trauma in the last few weeks. We've had a lot of experts on here just like yourself. And EMDR is something I do hear a lot of, but I've never had anybody talk about it before. <laughs> so let's do this. Um, tell me a little bit about your work in trauma, and then we'll get started into EMDR. Okay, so uh, as you mentioned, I specialize in trauma and grief. And in my career, I've worked with first responders. I've, I've been a police psychologist for the first 15 years of my career. And now I work with complex trauma and dissociation. I work with adults who've been sexually abused as children. And again, EMDR, of course, is a centerpiece of the therapy that I do. So I do want to say that EMDR therapy is an integrative psychotherapeutic approach. So before I go on about EMDR therapy, is there more you wanted to ask me about uh, my background or what I do? Yeah, you know, it's interesting on the... Um child abuse a lot of people don't realize a lot of times that stuff becomes hidden right there's little fragmentations of ourselves and we have to try to go back and access that a lot of people think when they're working with trauma and uh, tell us a little bit about child abuse and how does that differ like you said first responders police officers encounter a lot of different types of trauma that people don't realize uh, going in and seeing a child that's been killed or a child been molested uh, seeing crime scenes that they, that they didn't expect to see, um, car accidents, whatnot. But how does child abuse differ from adult trauma? All right. So as an adult, you know, first responder, we're, we're talking about single episode trauma. We have an intact adult who goes and has to engage in some horrible uh, activities and sees horrible things. Um, you know, the worst that society has to offer. And for police officers, there's life and death issues that occur. For firemen running into a burning building, you know, first responders are putting their life at risk. And indeed there are moments when they believe they're gonna die. And many have died in the line of duty. So we're talking though about intact adults who go through something horrible. So, when we're talking about child abuse, we're talking about a vulnerable child whose brain maybe is not fully developed. And we're also talking not just about, about the abuse itself, but we're talking about attachment trauma, attachment shock. So, I would like to say that complex trauma and dissociative disorders have at, at its root disorganized attachment where the source of safety, the caregiver can also be the source of terror. I also wanna say neglect is also very important. For example, there's a client that I'm working with now who 
experienced a lot of neglect from her parents. This left her very vulnerable to the attention of a psychopathic gardener when she was six years old. So a psychopath can detect when there is a child who's very hungry for a relationship and, and, and play into that and then ending up for abuse. So the abuse would happen and the child would go home, not really tell anybody, but then again at home already felt invisible, not seen. So we have the disorganized attachment style. You know, the parents were supposed to be a source of safety, but there was a lot of neglect. They were not a source of safety. And then we have the abuse that happened when she was six. So this is important to take into account and, and something else that I'm also you know, spending a lot of time doing presentations on and clinical work on that a lot of times the attachment trauma is worse than the abuse that was done. So because this is happening at a very vulnerable age and interfering with the attachment relationships, it has a long lasting impact. Also on the sense of self, it has an impact on the, the person's ability to regulate their affect. There can be a lot of shame and self-blame. For example, this client who I was telling you about blamed herself. You know, the gardener was attracted to my body, so it's my fault. And then we go and explore that. And what that's about is, well, if it's uh, my fault, not the gardener's fault, then it's not the fault of an adult. And then it's not the fault of my parents who didn't protect me and who neglected me, who didn't see me. So I hope you're hearing that the impact of the attachment, the, the disorganized attachment, as well as the abuse on the sense of self. It seems like it's very important to keep this kind of image of their parents pristine and shifting that blame to themselves, right? They want to keep them, their parents almost in this perfect vision in their head. Is that, is that an accurate representation? E yes, we want parents who are a source of safety and comfort and, and love. And guilt can be the price we pay also to feel in control, to make the world predictable. So that's a good point too, yeah, because we don't. That's the difference between a biological a child abuse situation compared to a stranger who abuses you, correct? Uh, yes, there, there, uh, there, certainly, there certainly is a difference. So certainly when the source of safety and the source of terror are the same, it certainly has a very negative impact. I remember talking to a pastor, uh, was it Pastor Turnipseed, and he has a powerful story where he says uh, when he was telling his story about his father being the abuser, he said that when I when I was little, I used to always get worried about the boogeyman, and I the, the, my world changed when my boogeyman was my father. He was the one who became the major threat at age five or six years of age, and it threw his world upside down. Yes, so certainly the when the caregiver is directly involved, it's much more intense and as very significant and deep impact. Now, I know a lot of, of, of trauma experts, such as yourself, now I'm not sure if you believe this or not, I think you do, but a lot of them say you're going to have to go back to find these fragmented cells and to resolve these inner conflicts. Um, but that journey is painful. And from what I've been hearing and talking to other individuals, EMDR provides a way to do that. No, not directly. So one, uh, I agree with you and the people that you've talked to that there is fragmentation of the personality. So when we're talking about complex trauma and dissociation, 
we have to do preparation work to deal with the parts of self and get collaboration and cooperation among the different parts of the personality with adult leadership. The person also has to be able to calm, do self-soothing. So this is the stabilization part of therapy. And when the person has the ability to stay present with the memory, and has the integrative capacity to stay present with the emotions that can come on up. And we have cooperation and collaboration among the different parts of the personality with the, the adult leadership, then we can do the memory work. And this is where EMDR therapy is very, very helpful. The theory is that Experiences that are too much to integrate get maladaptively stored in the brain. They're not able to fully process and they're stored in state specific form. There's, the, there's still the agitation, there's the reenactment, there's a the psychophysiological arousal that gets frozen in the brain, the thoughts, the images, the beliefs, it's my fault, I'm shameful, I'm bad, get maladaptively stored in the brain. So what EMDR therapy is, it, it's, a, it's an empirically evidence-based treatment for these disturbing memories. Oh, okay, I got it, okay. I know one of the analogies I like to use a lot, and I'm going to ask you a question that I always get from fledgling therapists all the time before I do that. But the analogy I usually use with a therapist is a lot of times with the Dante's Divine Comedy, right? The, the client is Dante themselves, and the guide Virgil takes them down through hell, the nine circles, and you're kind of visiting all these fragmented personalities that we have. We have to go through that journey all the way up. Um, but one of the things, the questions I always get from the fledgling therapist is always, how do you know they're ready to handle a certain memory, a certain trauma? How do you know? Can you know? Yes. Yeah. So first of all, if we're talking about uh, somebody with, with childhood abuse or even with adult onset trauma, we want to do an assessment. So there's a number of psychological you know, questionnaires that can be given to assess the level of dissociation. We wanna ask about background. We wanna ask about the attachment relationships. Ask what's going on, not only what happened in the past, how's life now, assess self-esteem, their ability to regulate emotions and affect and ask how the relationships are going. Also, with EMDR therapy, one of the things we do is a safe space exercise, like a safe, uh, where do you feel safe, or a resource, we call it resource development and installation. Think of a mastery experience, a moment you felt confident, competent, and good about yourself. So we identify these experiences and then we can add the bilateral stimulation that we do with EMDR therapy. And quite typically what happens is the positive feelings enhance. Now, this, will says, this says something. One, does it enhance or do other disturbing emotions start to come up? Or nothing happens because they're emotionally flat. So we can start out with stabilization and see how they respond to it. Now, the other thing that we would be, you know, we could be doing is of course, asking the client, besides how's life going now, think about the memory. And when they tell us about what happened, are they able to stay present? Are they, we don't need to have the details, but are they capable of telling us what happened and they're able to stay present. 
In other words, there is a beginning and a middle and an end. And even if they're crying, as they tell us, they're not discombobulating. And of course, how are they functioning in everyday life? So we have a session with somebody. What happens when they go home? And the time does come maybe when they, they, their, their social situation is stabilized at a good enough level. So the person is able to stay present at a good enough level, self-soothe, they have calming skills. Their psychosocial environment to a good enough level is stabilized. Then we can start processing the memory and it's, it's very interactive. So we bring up the memory and we want to, we want to have the person think about the image, right? What's the worst moment? We get a negative irrational belief about the self. I'm not safe. It's my fault. I'm not lovable, you know, for example. It's the meaning of the event to the self that we call it a negative cognition. It's a verbalization of the affect that's maladaptively stored from that memory. I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. I'm powerless. And then we identify a positive cognition, which is a therapeutic goal. I am good enough. I am lovable. I did the best I could. We take a rating. Well, how true does that feel to you now? You bring up the memory. How true are the words, do the words, I'm safe now, feel to you? On a one to seven scale, one false, seven true. Usually it's slow. Well, my head knows it's true. You know, I'm safe. I'm talking to you. But in my guts, no, it's a one, it's a two. And then we're going to get the emotions. I'm going to start going deeper now. And then how disturbing zero to 10, 10 being the worst, zero calm. Where do you feel in your body? So as we start to go through this, also we're able to assess, can the person stay present as well? Plus, this is a very helpful therapeutic discussion in and of itself. We want to go and activate the memory the way access the memory, the way that it's stored in the brain. So now we've accessed it. Then we can start doing the bilateral stimulation. It could be eye movement. It could be uh, auditory. It could be like, you know, tapping, especially on online. Maybe a person might do something like this. And we'll do maybe 30 seconds or so, 20, 30 seconds, more or less, depending on the client. And then we ask, what do you notice? So we're, we can assess each step of the way how the client is doing. And if, is it, are the associations coming up that are adaptive? Is the tension releasing? Are they getting therapeutic, helpful, adaptive insights as the memory's resolving? Okay. Or is a lot of affect coming up that's too much? In which case, there's a number of different things that we can do to slow it down. So there's a number of ways, number of ways we can do to, you know, first of all, stabilize the client as needed, assess their capacity to stay present with the trauma. We can increase their integrative capacity, ability to self-regulate. As needed, a lot of people don't need it. And then we can start doing the memory work. And at each point along the way, we, we can either continue or we can stop. And we ask our clients to give us a stop signal. To, you know, if something's too much, let me know. And we'll stop, see what's going on. So we build in these safeguards. We're not just plunging into an, an exposure overload. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. So, can you tell us a little bit about how the bilateralization works? Yes. The Well, for, first of all, what I do want to say is that studies have pretty much conclusively now shown that the eye movement in and of itself does have a therapeutic effect. And EMDR therapy does change the way the memory is stored in the brain. 
there's there's uh, studies, neurological studies that have shown pre post uh, EEGs, uh, quantitative EEGs of the brain before and after treatment. So there's a number of different theories. One theory that's received a lot of empirical support is that when you bring up the memory and you do some bilateral stimulation, it interferes with the working memory. All right. So what research has shown is that the images, negative images and negative feelings will decrease. So that's a, an important part of the story, but there's more. The adaptive information processing model, which guides EMDR therapy, you know, says that present problems are the result of these past experiences maladaptively stored. So we access that. And then we do the bilateral stimulation and what this seems to do is to stimulate the brain's natural healing mechanisms. Maybe there's some of the same mechanisms that are occurring during sleep. Certainly, uh, you know, REM sleep when we're dreaming and research uh, strongly suggests that maybe slow wave sleep, which, which pushes the memories, pushes the trauma through the brain. So what starts to happen is that the memory, as it's getting reprocessed the MDR therapy, you know, the working memory is interfered with, negative images decrease, emotions decrease. And what happens is that the adaptive information that we have that's stored in the brain starts to link in. So we have maladaptively stored information. We have adaptive information. I'm gonna die, but I know I'm safe. It's just not, it's not connecting. So when we go through the protocol, and it's so much more than just eye movement, so much more, that adaptive information is able to link in, and that maladaptively stored memory integrates within the wider memory network, is no longer, no longer isolated, and actually becomes part of a person's resilience. It's something that happened. It's not happening now. I survived and now it becomes a resource that can inform future behavior. That's very important too. That's amazing stuff. So it affects working memory, short-term and then long-term memory. And then it helps them to be able to deal with um, future, I guess, incidences that might, remember, that might remind them of that trauma so if they have an incident, let's say we have a military soldier, he has PTSD. Um, there's a story I always share about a friend of mine whose daughter uh, ended up going on a first date with a military soldier. And on the first date, he said, bring over a movie. We're going to have dinner. He was in the kitchen cooking. She puts down the movie into the, into the TV. Um, I don't know if you ever saw Black Hawk Down. I did. Yeah, not the best movie, probably for somebody with PTSD she didn't know he had anything she put the movie in I don't even know he realized it and when he started going to the scenes of shooting which is like 80 percent of the movie when it started going he, he became catatonic and she couldn't tell what was going on he wasn't talking he wasn't doing anything he was just sitting there in the kitchen and then she eventually she had to call 911 um mm -hmm. but does it help you with that you said resilience those are kind of reminding me of this so when that individual is starting to, I'm, I'm going to, you can tell me if I'm correct here, so they're detaching the negative maladaptive memories or emotions or cognitions from their memories and attaching these positive cognitions, is that helping them the next time they may encounter an incident like that? They, they could have re-traumatized them? Does it provide that? Yeah. Yes, it does. And there's been research uh, uh, with, with children, I believe, that have uh, shown that. So... Uh, what EMDR therapy will, will do is it, it uh, one way to think about it, it changes the way the memory is stored in the brain. So another important mechanism is the reconsolidation of the memory. When a memory is activated and there's also some new information available, that memory has the potential to be stored in a new way. So we can look at EMDR therapy 
as changing the way the memory is stored, the memory gets reconsolidated. So as one veteran put it, the, the, um, uh, he was, uh, you know, commander of a convoy and, 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 and somebody, uh, a local person, as he puts it, and he's in Afghanistan, is on a motorcycle trying to get close and just won't go away. So he has to give the order to, to take him down. So they run him over and they make eye contact. And this was the worst part. And this is a veteran of firefights and even a helicopter crash, but that eye contact made it personal and you know, felt a lot of guilt. And so is reliving this and you know, continually reliving this. So we use EMDR therapy to you know, reprocess this memory. And then he's able to say, I did what I needed to do to keep me safe, to keep the men safe. And knew, did what I, uh, I needed to do to survive. And then he says, it's over. I can think about it now, it's in the past, I'm not feeling it now. So that is what integration is. It's something that happened and it happened to me, but it's not happening now. And EMDR therapy is not gonna take away appropriate emotions. It's not gonna take away anything that is true. It's something bad that happened, that's over, and, and I survived and can indeed inform the future that I survived, I can learn from this. And so the next time they encounter something similar, something similar, it's not gonna trigger the past trauma. So it's very important for people, for, for first responders, people exposed to danger all the time to have ways to clear out the trauma. Otherwise it can have a cumulative effect. Well, that's very problematic. Yes, so we reprocess the memory. It's something that happened that's not happening now. I can learn from it. And this informs future behavior. So the next time there's some kind of a critical encounter, the person can focus on what's happening with all the choices of response instead of a past memory of fear, for example, being triggered and the person responding solely out of fear from past events that have accumulated and are maladaptively stored. Fascinating when you said the reconsolidation of the memory and uh, then I started thinking about things I've heard in regards to temporality there, because I, I can see there's something to do with time. A lot of these individuals will, they, when they get re-traumatized or think about it, as you mentioned, they access those memories. They feel like it's happening again right now. But yes. You said it separates them. It puts them away from that. And it, this is in the past. It isn't happening right now. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, would you reckon, so that's when the integrative component is, at that point, let's say they, they've, they've gotten to that stage where now they say this is in the past, do you continue doing other forms of therapy as well? Well, first, let me say that we want to process the past memory. Hmm. Then we want to process the present triggers. Now, for example, this veteran I was talking about, he comes back, he's got PTSD, goes to a restaurant, sits at the back in a corner so he could scan the room. Going to Walmart to shop was um, like a mission. Here's the time of day I'm gonna go. Here's where I'm gonna park. Here's how I'm gonna enter. I'll get my stuff and here's how I'm gonna exit. You know, there's planning a mission. So we wanna process not just the past, uh, but certainly processing the past trauma took away a lot of the fear, but also these present triggers too. And then we wanna lay down we call it a future template, a pattern for adaptive behavior. So now let's imagine being able to go to Walmart knowing that it's over and that yes, you can be alert, but you can be relaxed knowing you're not in danger now. So we do past, present, future. So EMDR is, is um, you know, it's eight phases and it's uh, these three prongs, past, present, in future. And then yes, EMDR is an integrative psychotherapy. So when it comes to single episode trauma, 
at least for me, EMDR therapy would be the treatment of choice. You know, it's well researched and depending on the study, you know, 77 to 100% of people no longer will meet criteria for PTSD wow. after the equivalent of three to six sessions, all right? But now you have multiple traumatization. We have to increase the dosage. And then when we have complex trauma, like we were talking about, we have to do stabilization, we want to teach calming. And as you said, we have to work with the different fragments or parts of the personality and get cooperation, collaboration among the parts with adult leadership. So there's other frameworks that would inform us how to do that. For example, the theory of structural dissociation of the personality can guide us there. Now, we can include EMDR methodology in resource work and, and enhancing positive experiences, building up a, a, a integrative capacity, doing safe place exercises, and even enhancing the feeling of cooperation among the parts, uh, helping the parts... Uh, you know, share the information with each other. So there's a number of different ways EMDR methodology and elements can be utilized within these framework. And then comes the time for memory, memory work. And we, you know, we have some adaptations that we would do for special populations, but we do have a standard protocol that we use now that the person can be present and we've, uh, we've, we've uh, done our assessment, okay, I'm not going in blind, and then we can go and reprocess the memory. And then after that, of, of course, the, you know, the person is now is freed up to engage in life in new ways, engage in relationships in new ways. But of course, that uh, we do stabilization, we'll do memory work. A lot of uh, emotions may come up. We do more stabilization, more memory work. Then they're able to engage in life in a new way. But that brings up new memories, so we do more memory work. So you know these these different phases of therapy, we you know go back and forth. So this is why we can also say that EMDR therapy is an integrative approach where we will combine whatever therapeutic methodologies are needed for the specific population. So I do a lot of work with grief and I'm informed by a number of different theoretical frameworks about grief and mourning that helps guide me, uh, guide my EMDR therapy. What, how do I do an assessment? Understanding the clinical phenomena. Where is the person in the morning process? So EMDR is an integrative psychotherapeutic approach. Fascinating stuff. Did a great job outlining that whole process. That was wonderful. Again, folks, this is Dr. Roger M. Solomon. You can find him at rogermsolomon.com or emdr.com. Provides a lot of good training there. I guess one of my last few questions here before we're ready to wrap up. Um, you mentioned earlier you can do tapping, you can do the eye movement with the finger. What is the what is the difference? Why do we switch from one to the other? Do we use both? Well, what research has shown is that the eye movement is uh, more is most effective for most people, but not everybody. And again, there is research on the therapeutic effect just of the kind of eye movement that we use. It's, you can imagine the skepticism that EMDR was met with when it first came out. I was certainly skeptical, okay? And then uh, of course, researchers are going, yeah, right, fingers moving. Well, so it's been researched and a number of very good meticulous studies, um, many of them done in, in um, the Netherlands, uh, really, looking at the impact. And there's even been studies on rats where, that have been traumatized and they, the scientists found a way to get the rats that were traumatized to, to get their eyes moving. And, and of course, they're able to go into the brain afterwards and see what changed and shifted. But the eye movements did reduce 
you know, the trauma of the rats and they were able to, you know, pinpoint the neurological mechanisms that were involved in places in the brain and, and uh, you know, brain stem that, that uh, were impacted. So uh, rats are not human beings, but it does show that there is some kind of a physiological connection that we don't quite know about yet. Now, as I said before, there's also uh, the bilateral stimulation interferes with working memory. Also an orienting response. You think of the memory, the eye movement or even the tapping or sound that produces an orienting reflex, which may have something to do with reducing avoidance so that adaptive information can start to link in. So, there's, there's a number of these uh, mechanisms that, that uh, are involved here. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Online, we want to be especially cautious too. Um, again, and be, because we're online, it's, it's, it's remote. EMDR can be very powerful. And it's very important that a person's trained. It looks simple, but it's not. It's very complex, very complex. And we only teach therapists or advanced students. There's a lot of things to consider and it's very, very powerful. So online, we wanna be very sure about the stabilization and have methods, uh, be, be sure the person has methods to, you know, to calm. And you know, the eye movement can be jagged online, but uh, to much to my surprise, you know, too, online EMDR therapy, has been effective so, um, and even doing the tapping. And somebody would have told me March 15th of last year that me, okay, Roger Solomon, <laughs> program director, EMDR Institute, would be doing online EMDR with taps. I would have said, okay, those are fighting words. <laughs> okay, but we, we adapt. And some of my best sessions have, have been online using a number of these different methodologies. Now, I also want to say something very important. The therapeutic relationship is crucial. It's crucial. There are still, you know, therapy is still therapy. And when we're going in, especially on complex trauma, there's gotta be the trust that, that's there. And as John Watkins, the father of ego state therapy used to say, is that the, the uh, problem is big and the client is small, but when the therapist ego joins with the client's ego, then the client is big and the problem is small. Or there's the combined window of tolerance. The therapist stays with the client. And if the client goes to hell, the therapist goes to hell with them and through the other side. So it's not mechanical at all. It really is therapy. And there is that joining process. And that's so important online. In fact, I was so surprised to how it, it, the therapeutic relationship very much can be there online. It's fascinating. I guess, especially after last year, after March 15th, there's a lot of people over a month after month that are really hungry for therapy and, and to, to get a better understanding of their world. So I can definitely see that. Fascinating, fascinating indeed. Are you going to keep doing work online or <laughs> you taking it back to the Institute once things open up? Well, we'll see what we, we'll, we'll probably have both. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll probably have both the, uh, the, um, you know, certainly the online training we're finding is working, but of course people miss the interaction. And there is a difference between practicing and learning a method on, online versus working it live. But it, it's been surprising to me how well it has the, the workshops and learning EMDR can be taught online and, and given to those clients. It's, it's been surprising how, how effective it has been. But I think everybody and you know, me too, you know, I miss the interaction. Uh, that goes on and, and uh, of, uh, you know, and, and participating and engaging people live. So certainly our trainings online are, you know, that I do, and I, I do a lot of training in, in many, many different countries. So, you know, this morning I was doing training in Finland. So 
Oh, wow. We, yeah, we start at 1.30, it's a seven hour difference. All right, so I'm 1.30 in the morning where I am, 8.30 where they are, and because uh, I can't travel there you know, right now. Yeah. Hopefully that, that'd change. But yes, we can do it online. But I certainly can't wait to, you know, to the day and we're scheduled in uh, September to, you know, to go back to Finland. So I hope that can happen. <laughs> I hope so too. Fascinating stuff. And you made a great point too, Dr. Solomon. It may seem easy to some people out there, but please don't do it on your own. Make sure you're trained properly and have the right certifications. This is not a joke. Uh, you're messing with people's Absolutely. lives. Absolutely. This is, this is crucial, all right? Not to just read a book and do it. There's much more to it. And also, uh, EMDR therapy is successful. And because it is successful, there's a lot of people who have different names and say, I'll teach you this kind of eye movement or that. So it's very important that there, it, it is that the training, you know, that the, you know, the trainer is indeed certified by the EMDR International Association. Okay. Now, uh, I teach the EMDR Institute. This was Francine Shapiro's Institute. Oh, the Francine pioneer. Shapiro <laughs> that created the pioneer. Yeah. And she passed a couple of years ago. But we, you know, the training into her training institute is still going on. But it is important to have an accredited trainer and there is an EMDR International Association that sets standards for, for the training, who can, uh, who can do the training, who are the people uh, who can participate in the training. So there are standards and it's very important that there is this, they go to an accredited training. Absolutely. Wonderful stuff. Again, rogermsolomon.com or emdr.com if you want to learn more about it. Thank you so much, Dr. Solomon, for being here. All right. It was a pleasure. And thank you very much for uh, uh, having me. And thank you very much for what you do to, for the interviews and, and all the information that you're able to disseminate. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Make sure to share and subscribe and hit that like button. We truly appreciate it.